It's not in the headlines. It's not above the fold in the New York Times or the Washington Post, but it is China ascendant. We see a yuan making a jump condition to yuan strength. Does it signal finally a commodity boom? Well, there is a commodity boom. I don't know whether that's signaling it. I think what's really signaling it is getting out of a recession. We're having the most uh, remarkable recovery following the most remarkable recession given the pandemic. And all recoveries are, are commodity intensive in the demand side. And this one is especially so given the depths to which demand had fallen last year. Tell me uh, the inventory rebuild that's out there right now. It's always a mystery in China, but they load it up. What's the dynamic of inventory of copper, iron, and the rest of it in China right now? <laughs> Inventories are really low, whether you look at iron ore or steel uh, or copper or aluminum. Inventories are really, really low. And the question is, how low can they stay in for how long? And it looks like they will stay low for a long time. We look at the, the scrap market for steel, the scrap market for copper, and they're, they're, they're at record levels. So uh, that's an indication that the inventory of things that go into those products are just not available. Taking a step back, Ed, just to sort of dovetail both of Tom's questions together, there is a question of how much pricing power China still has over the commodities complex. Goldman Sachs coming out and saying that they've lost that power, especially as developed markets, the U.S., Europe, engage in infrastructure spending. Do you agree? Uh, yes, I do agree. And uh, we've seen it in the Chinese effort to damp down on speculation. Uh, they announced they're going to damp down on speculation. They announced that they're going to damp down on volatility. Prices go down. But then the, the real inventory situation, the real supply demand balance picks up. So China's looking for lower cost, lower priced commodities, and they don't have the power to do that. There's also a question of whether you can have a commodity super cycle, as many people have been calling this, without the participation of oil. And could you have the participation of oil if you have such pushback uh, by investors on the likes of Exxon and Shell on becoming a greener operation on adapting to a world trying to flight, uh, fight co climate change? What's your view on the outlook for oil, given that backdrop? Well, first of all, I agree with the, the view that you can't have a super cycle without oil being part of it. Uh, and all the super cycles we have seen have had massive disruptions in oil supply is a real kicker. Uh, and the reason that is important is that all commodities are energy intensive to a dramatic degree, whether you look at ags or metals, uh, any you pick a commodity and it's going to be energy intensive. Uh, aluminum is particularly energy intensive. Uh, but then we look at the horizon. There are two things that are fighting each other. One is demand is not growing the way it used to grow. Yes, we, we're, in a re, we're in a recovery, and that's a very robust short-term phenomenon. But we look out to 2030, and the big debate is how far away from the historical growth level in demand, how far down is it going to be? And then we look at the supply side, uh, both medium and longer term. We have, uh, we have OPEC countries, Saudi Arabia and the UAE in particular, that are doing what? They're increasing their production capacity. Uh, we have Iran off the market, teetering maybe at the at the uh, at, at the cusp of an agreement with the United States. They they have 1.8 million barrels a day of oil offline that's coming back uh, at some point between now and a year and a half from now. Uh, and then uh, we have oil, oil everywhere, and the price is lower because of the technological revolution that took place with the last super cycle. So I wouldn't say that this is going to be uh, a write off of oil. Uh, it depends on who has it, where it is, and no matter where you find it, it's going to be fairly easy to produce. So it may not be a write-off of oil here, Ed, but to Lisa's point that uh, she was making in her question as well, with regards to the pressure that is now on a lot of these fossil fuel companies, uh, the idea that they should be pivoting more to renewable energy in some way, or at least kind of hedging their bets with regards to the outlook for oil demand, is it a little premature now for these companies, for those companies that have traditionally sort of relied on fossil fuels and made their profits off of fossil fuels to make that pivot? Well, it's not, it's not premature to make the pivot to decarbonize. How that decarbonization works is another matter. But we, we have a massive amount of capital going into carbon capture and sequestration, uh, decarbonizing what's needed and fossil fuels are needed. It is a, uh, it is, it is a, uh, you know, it, it's wishful thinking to think that the world is going to grow power generation that's non-interruptible based on renewables. That's not going to happen in the next 
10 or 15 years. So we're in a world where we have to live with fossil fuels, whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the moment, the unfortunate part of the way things are pricing is that uh, oil is pricing below its social contribution. Yeah, definitely. With regards to, though, uh, the, the push into more renewable forms of energy, and particularly uh, all of the talk we have here about EVs, uh, part of the commodity boom that we've seen as of late has been, if I'm not mistaken, directly tied to that, particularly with some of uh, the industrial metals and minerals. Oh, undoubtedly. Uh, the demand for power generation is ubiquitous. You take the three largest economies in the world, the European Union economy, the U.S. and China, uh, they're all moving toward that that EV world in a uh, in an accelerating way, uh, and that requires more power generation. And what do you need to do that? You need batteries. And what do you need to make batteries? Mm. You need an array of metals. You need nickel. You need lithium. You need copper. Yeah. You need aluminum. You need uh, cobalt and manganese. So it's a it's a commodity intensive environment, particularly metal intensive. Right. Yeah, Edward Moss, I got one question, and this comes off our important interview with Andrew Forrest, the giant of Perth in West Australia, on green hydrogen. He's got more money than God, and he's putting it into green hydrogen. We're going to crack ammonia and come up with a free launch here. Do you buy, as a carbon guy, the future of green hydrogen, or is it a myth? Oh, no, it's by no means a myth. The question is, how quickly will we see the cost structure coming down? There are two major cost structures there. One is the cost of renewables. They are going down. Yes. Uh, we're seeing what about the electrolyte? Down, but the electrolyzer is the other one. And uh, and the the big thing that we're waiting for is economies of scale. Uh, we're, we're seeing electrolyzers really made by, they're not quite ma and pa companies, but we haven't seen the build out of the economies of scale that are required. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to be there. And then the question is going to be location, location, location. Where is there going to be the combination of electrolyzer availability and non-interruptible wind, non-interruptible solar? And Australia is very well positioned on, on the renewable side. 